Kalkania. We are today very blessed to have with us Professor Jeevan Titial, who is a professor at RP Center Ames. We have Dr. Arup Homik with us, and we have Dr. Santanu Mitra with us, who will be doing a presentation on pterygium in the ASCRS style. I'm very grateful to Professor Jeevan Titial. If you see his WhatsApp, it says Gio or Gine Do, but I know, sir, and uh, it is Padho or Padne Do. He's <laughs> such, such into academic that we are truly blessed that today the postgraduates will have his blessing of his presentation. I have with us also Dr. Sagar Bhargav, who will be the moderator of today's session, uh, who is a consultant at BBI Foundation, and I would like to request him to please introduce all the speakers. Dr. Sagar Bhargav. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's indeed a great uh, privilege and uh, pleasure to be here moderating this session. And uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Shantanu Mitra now. Dr. Mitra completed his MBBS in 1983 from Neil Ritan Sarkar Medical Hello. College. And uh, Hello. yeah, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So he, he did his uh, post graduation from RIO Sitapur. And he, he has been a recipient of Colonel Rangachari Award, which is the best scientific paper presentation at All India Ophthalmic Conference in 2007 in Hyderabad. He also received best free paper presentation in orbit and oculoplasty at AOS conference in 2004 at Varanasi. He has also been a recipient of a prestigious technology award of physical sciences, including engineering, for developing manufacturing technology of bioceramic implants for medical applications from Honorable Minister Shri Prathvira Chauhan in 2010 at New Delhi. He is also uh, a winner of uh, Best of the Show Award, which is a prestigious award at American Academy of Ophthalmology Annual Meet 2011 Florida, USA. For his uh, famous video on no suture, no glue, conjunctival autografting in pterygium. He has presented numerous papers, posters, videos, and instruction courses at state, national, and international forums, and uh, we are very fortunate to have him as a speaker. Also, would like to introduce to Dr. Arup Bhomik, who is an outstanding uh, surgeon in this part of the uh, uh, country. He is a senior consultant at uh, Deshai Hospital, Department of Cataract, Refractive, and Cornea, and he has had many recognitions. Uh, prominent among them is KP Roy Award for Best Paper by Ophthalmic. Society of West Bengal 2002, uh, Sova Devi Award for Best Video in Ophthalmology, uh, Ophthalmologic Society of West Bengal in 2014. He also has a gold medal from IRCI, uh, IRSI in 2014. And uh, he did India proud by winning a grand prize, which is the top award at ACRS in 2010 for his wonderful video. Uh, I think we have all seen his video and it's a fantastic video for which he got the best award, best prize. Then he also won a best uh, in the innovative video session in ESRS uh, 2010 at Paris and also won a best video award in uh, ACRS 2013. So with this brief introduction, I, I call upon Dr. Shantanu Mitra for uh, for talking to us about Terigium and uh, Dr. Arup Obik will also chip in in a little bit of different kind of a style of yeah. uh, presentation. Uh Shagar, I just uh, want to clarify. Uh, we actually are planning to do the question answer session and uh, case basis uh, discussion for the uh, pterygium. Uh, but uh, the problem we face is a, a quick sharing of uh, screen is not possible. Then uh, we decide planning to, to stick to our uh, previous planning to uh, conventional planning to presentation and in between presentation. Anytime you feel, uh, you can stop us and we can discuss this uh, uh, so that the PG uh, postgraduate student can get benefited. I am privileged to have uh, Dr. Shantanu Mitra with me to speaking uh, regarding pterygium. He is the authority of pterygium uh, surgery because uh, his technique in uh, no glue, no suture is, uh, uh, is uh, even in a AO, you search for any any kind of pterygium uh, information that Mitro's profile will come fast, AO. And he is doing pterygium surgery almost last 20 years, and uh, uh, and including all difficult type of surgery, including you know that uh, pterygium surgery recurrent pterygium basically is a reconstruction of the surface, ocular surface, not only the pterygium surgery. So uh, we. Have, uh, we 
in between we we'll like to discuss any any issue regarding the terrigium so that you can stop us any in between the our presentation you can ask and you can discuss okay uh, i'll sure. uh, 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 I'll, i'd like to invite uh, dr mitra to start his presentation okay thank you dr arup uh, thank you dr shagar and uh, uh, thank you Please everybody uh, for giving, okay Please. for giving me this opportunity uh, uh, i request everybody to unmute yourself except shagar me and dr mitra unmute name mute unmute only uh, i mute sorry yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> is it coming my screen is visible no no no, no it's not visible it's not shared okay. as yet is, is it visible hello still not no not, not yet still not not yet still not yet mm -hmm. हेलो now it's coming you can keep in presentation yeah, mode it's coming yes so uh, good afternoon everybody thanks to dr arup dr shagar and uh, dr srina for giving me this opportunity we are trying to demystify terrigium it's a big dilemma in our day to day practice so in this uh, discussion we will uh, try to answer these questions which i have set it here what is the definition of a terrigium how does it open what are the treatment options we have what is the ideal time to intervene which should be the best surgical procedure uh, free conjunctival autograph or limbal conjunctival autograph sutures glue or something else or graft fixation and how to tackle more difficult situations so this i found find the most comprehensive definition of terrigium which might sound like uh, chatur giving the definition of motor in three idiots but this is the best possible definition terrigium is a wing shaped corneal incursion of an aberrant conjunctival wound healing response characterized by the centripetal growth of an altered squamous epithelium with goblet cell hyperplasia and an underlying stroma of activated proliferating fibroblasts neovascularization inflammatory cells and extracellular matrix this actually describes the pathogenesis of the process also but uh, however after describing in so elaborate way the bottom line is the precise pathogenesis remains unclear so it has been described long back in 600 bc by sisro who called it arma surgery was then also the only curative treatment and recurrence then also was the main key problem just like today so it is the epidemiology is commonly found in warm sunny geographical areas in a 30 degree peri equatorial latitude belt at high altitude and in highly reflective environments due to elevated levels of ultraviolet radiation there are many theories of its uh, occurrence but uh, mostly we concentrate around the uv radiation due to the cumulative effect of absorbed uv rays between 290 to 320 nanometer by eye surface the limbal theory which says that there are migrant keratoblasts may originate from limbal stem cells leading to terrigia and there are some altered growth factors like altered mmp interleukins uh, and vegf so ev light forms free radicals that induce damage in dna rna and the extracellular matrix of cells ultraviolet b induces expression of cytokines and growth factors in terrigial epithelial cells there is some dna break repair leading to a uh, predisposition genetic predisposition to terrigium development and there is increased level of t cells and inflammatory markers uh, noted in conjunctival tissue of terrigium compared to normal conjunctival tissue all these findings suggest 
a pterygium is not just a degenerative lesion but could be a result of uncontrolled cell proliferation so between primary pterygium and recurrent pterygium the histology differs there is uh, in primary pterygium we find uh, elastotic degeneration which is actually a vesophilic degenerated collagen fibrils in sub epithelial stroma which is not found in recurrent pterygium and whether in recurrent pterygium the body is made up of mainly fibrous tissue and this is the clinical anatomy of pterygium which we can see in a slit lamp the importance here is of the stokers line uh, which i'm coming in details these are the parts of a pterygium this is a hood hook spots stoker line apex or head and body in the hood hook spot and stoker line in a stationary pterygium these are easily visible so stoker line you can never find in an active pterygium which is growing there is not enough time to form the stoker line the pigment deposition in the cornea similarly the uh, hook spots that is not clearly visible in an active pterygium due to micro ulceration formation and cloudy stroma so the clinical classification of pterygium there are lots and lots of classifications but clinically uh, important classifications is one is tans classification which is which divides the pterygium into mild moderate and severe where the visibility of the episcleral vessels through the pterygium demarcated between the three category uh, in mild form you can clearly visible episcleral vessels throughout and in severe form there is totally obscured episcleral blood vessels through the pterygium moderate falls in between and there is another type of classification which is slightly elaborate this is small advanced and advanced also including the optical zone involvement so basically small primary pterygium again maybe of three types advanced primary pterygium or recurrent pterygium with no optical zone involvement and advanced primary or recurrent pterygium with optical zone involvement so these are the symptoms we know uh, uh, sometimes your patient comes uh, for a cosmetic uh, problem only so in those cases you have to be very clear cut about that uh, aesthetically uh, best result possible you have to explain to them because his problem or her problem is mainly a redness around the inner canthus of the eye so how do you diagnose a pterygium mostly by slit lamp examination you can have anti segment photography and by slit lamp examination you can differentiate the different parts of pterygium also and uh, also you can do an oculizer which can give you a corneal topographical changes sometimes which is affected by a pterygium and this will help you from differentiating from other commonly find diseases now the treatment option what options do you have when what are the aims of your treatment you have to restore an uninterrupted refractive surface and there should be low recurrence rate minimization of serious complications and satisfactory cosmetic outcome so the treatment options we have is a medical that is mainly supportive then the mostly uh, treatment option we have is a surgical option which may be a simple excision uh excision with tissue graft that is the conjunctival autograft or you can use amniotic membrane transplant also or you can combine them or adjuvants like mmc and 5a2 there are some other treatments which have been advocated like laser therapy anti vhg and corticosteroid uh, injections intralesionally or as drops so which is the best surgical option this will be dealt later also by dr arun gobi we have found by uh, literature that conjunctival autografting currently is the gold standard for treatment of pterygium because of its uh, low recurrence rate and uh, minimum fatal complications so now i uh, switch over to dr arun gobi uh, who will be discussing about the different techniques of uh, pterygium uh, surgery of conjunctival autografting dr gobi please uh, please unshare your uh, unshare your uh, screen then i i am able to share my screen yes yes i i have done i have done that no not uh, still not you unshare unshare your screen please unshare. i have already unshared my screen yes i have unshared my screen now okay
in between you can discuss uh, so that there is a technical uh, each uh, yeah uh, so there is a question in between why nasal pterygium is more common than the temporal pterygium yes there is a theory that uh, this uh, ultraviolet uh, ray transmission because of the, the interference of the nose the ultraviolet rays are mostly transmitted temporally and they are uh, the diffracted through the corneal surface and uh, mostly uh, 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 gathered at the uh, nasal uh, uh, part so that's why there is uh, this uh, more occurrence of nasal pterygium this is a theory you cannot prove this but this is a theory has big uh, is, we can see is my, is, is yeah, my yeah, yeah. Uh, screen yes sir your screen is visible yeah. so i have a question to shantanuda uh, yes dr meet so which time we should operate or treat a pterygium surgically uh, as 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 you know that stockard's line all that not seen in the progressive pterygium so yes so, where, so wherever it, uh, yes yes sir yeah now uh, how can i judge this uh, this uh, uh, this patient has a progressive pterygium it will with time it creates a lot of astigmatism even then it can create it can go over the pupillary axis the, how we assess that pterygium so the stoffer's line and fuchs spots they actually uh, if if are present then it, they indicate it's that it's that it's a stationary it's a stationary pterygium right now it's not progressing so you have to observe do an anterior segment photography from time to time you ask the patient to come and uh, whenever you see that it's progressing you can go for uh, surgery otherwise the you can do an ocularizer or a corneal topography test and if there is more than a uh, four diopter of astigmatism uh, being shown uh, uh, it's better to go for a pterygium which is causing a visual disturbance and also if there is uh, already some pterygium which is touching the pupillary border or beyond the pupillary margin progressing beyond the pupillary margin it should not be delayed it should be operated immediately even then uh, uh, there is a lot of distortion or astigmatism of peripheral cornea if you see the eye trace uh, value of a pterygium if you choose the central 3 mm it will not showing any astigmatism uh, that's and why keratometry uh, yeah. uh, eye trace yes. is a better um, uh, objectivity uh, than uh, so it is better to do 5 mm at least zone for the assessment of pterygium to assess the astigmatism created by pterygium because in the in a very very progressive very advanced pterygium only can create astigmatism in a central 3 mm zone so whenever we assess the uh, uh, astigmatism in the eye trace or topography to better to see even the peripheral astigmatism also to assess the astigmatism created by pterygium So this is a very, I think it, it is one of the important part. And so I am starting by pterygium. The management of pterygium, uh, I'll uh, mainly concentrate in the surgery part. But there is a last one decade or more than one decade, there is a, some medical therapy also in in case of uh, uh, pterygium. This is an injection of uh, avastin, mainly an uh, in, injection of avastin. and most popular is injection of five uh, for urethra uh, so how this is a, this is a basically uh, uh, acts over the recurrent of pterygia so it is very important to identify pick up the early conjunctival recurrence not the corneal one if you identify the corneal uh, or recurrence uh, conjunctival recurrence so what is the, you can see this here here is a basically conjunctival recurrence if you identify this then intra lesion of recurrence of fibro uh, urasil um, 3 to 4 injection even in the out with the slit lamp uh, it is very effective to reduce the recurrence of conjunctival recurrence but if it is once uh, it uh, progress to the to the ultimately progress to the corneal recurrence then it is very difficult to control the hello hello hello, hello. Uh, some noise hello can you mute everybody uh, uh, some yeah yeah 
Hello, everybody, please mute yourself. So uh, I'll start it. Hello? Uh, surgical treatment uh, is basically as uh, it's a gold standard is conjunctive or autograph. Technique wings are crack, clack, or crack. So, and the conjunctival uh, autograph to EMT, that's this, uh, these two cases are basically we keep for the, there is, if there is a lot of uh, ocular surface damage, what it occurs in the recurrent pterygium and uh, even recurrent three to four times uh, of operated in patient came to us, is a lot of vascular tissue and the most of the uh, uh, limbal cell that's damaged, then we have to plan this AMT or AMT with mini slip. This and uh, these two thing, two type of uh, surgery generally we prime primary um, pterygial surgery. It is mainly restricted to the CAC, CLAG, and CRAC. The aim of the surgery to basically they replace the pterygium with a healthy piece of bulbar conjunctiva to bear the sclera. As you know, the bear sclera technique, which we used to do in the almost 20 years back. There's a lot of recurrence, almost 50% cases of recurrence and study shows, even it is higher recurrence rates up to the 70%. Why autograph? Conjunctival autograph is a surgery generally regarded as a procedure of choice. This is a procedure of the primary and even in recurrent region because its efficacy and long-term safety. And there is a lot of study. There is a recurrence rate, uh, rate of this conjunctival autograph is very, very less. How you fix the graft? If you do the grafting technique, it's a, you can choose the suture as this uh, uh, this webinar is for the PGT. And I know the most of the PGT now do not access to the glue. So I am sh showing all my technique in doing the suture. The, the gold standard is fibrin glue because the fibrin glue has a limited or very less inflammation. And that's why the recurrence rate of the of the uh, pterygium, a uh, recurrence rate of pterygium is very very less. And auto blood definitely is a, a, an option. The problem uh, of auto blood uh, is it is a slightly technically diff difficult. And there maybe there is a shrinkage of graft in few cases and loss of graft maybe happen in this particular case. Except very very. Uh, Expert hand like Dr. Mitro is doing the more than 200 to 300 cases of auto blood uh, technique in Tedija. Cautery you can do cautery, but in that case you have to take the very large graft. But even then there is a create a lot of inflammation, so it is better not to practice. So gold standard is fibrin glue. If you don't have the fibrin glue and the, for the PGT, I think you can try sutra. And if you master uh, with the suture, then you, you can do fibrin glue uh, technique easily. So uh, it's our preferred method to excise uh, the base at least to four millimeter from the line. But basically, this is not a gold standard. It is depend on to case to case, uh, case to case in very small pterygium. Uh, we need to dissect very minimum of uh, amount of uh, uh, subconjunctival tissue. But where there is a fleshy mass, you have to remove a lot of, uh, lot of subconjunctival tissue or pterygium mass. Uh, in the, so this, this is not a gold standard. But in generally, my technique, I at least remove at a 4 to 6 millimeter from the line of, uh, uh, from the line of head. So this is a technique. Uh, this is a free conjunctiva. This is a graph technique. If uh, surgical pulse is free conjunctival uh, harvested from superotemporal or inferior valve. If possible, it is better to take from the inferior valve conjunctiva because superior uh, superior valve conjunctiva should be kept for long term if uh, for glaucoma surgery. If patient need the glaucoma surgery in future, it is bet, uh, better to keep the superior conjunctiva intact. You can take the conjunctiva from the superior temporal region, but avoid uh, it's better to take 
very thin uh, conjunctival graft. It is avoid to try to avoid the uh, tenon tissue as much as possible. Avoid conjunctival bartolone during dissection. And if you can, if you it would better to take at least one millimeter larger in all dimension than the area have to cover. Sorry, that is some problem. Uh, so you can click on uh, image. Uh, this is a technique. Uh, I always am I sharing my screen? Uh, so it's a blank white screen now as of now. As a blank screen, no? Yes, sir. Yes. Is it coming? Yes, now? sir. Yeah, it is coming, sir. Uh, uh, yes, is it started. Yes. Yeah. Started. Uh, this, uh, this is a. Uh, my preferred technique to fill uh, the conjunctival head from the cornea. Actually, if you get the separation line, it is very easy to fill the conjunctival uh, area. Uh, and uh, I always prefer to smoothen the corneal surface. Either it is possible with the blade, a squeeze and blade by simple scraping, or I always uh, I do diamond bar polish. Sorry, sorry for that. Sorry for the technical problem. Uh, you can see that I'm using diamond bar polish to smooth in the cornea because it is very important to, to smooth the cornea so that it, uh, if you smoothen the cornea, that definitely recurrence rate is less. Now I am smoothing the, uh, I dissecting the conjunctival flap from the pterygia mass, conjunctiva from the pterygium mass, going uh, subconjunctival area to dissect uh, without making any button holing in the conjunctiva. You can see that the pterygia mass is there, and you, now it is, it is better to cauterize the conjunctival, uh, subconjunctival tissue so that there is a minimum uh, amount of bleeding will be there. So I can dissect the conjunctival, uh, uh, subconjunctival tissue, marking the area of defect, uh, area I needed to cover with the conjunctiva and marking that you know, this is a special, uh, a special uh, uh, forcep to lift the conjunctiva uh, without tenon. You can see that this is a two tooth. There is a gap in between so that you can Pull the conjunctiva now under the uh, conjunctiva you pull some amount of BSS or you can uh, apply uh, the um, gylocard injection and so that in that process if you follow this process you can basically it is you can uh, see there is a big uh, conjunctiva flap without any tenon and the very thin conjunctiva and it, it is once it is cut, it is harvested over the harvested over the cornea. So the and now it is oriented accordingly and pull pull it is a pull so that it is easily come to the place. It will pull the uh, conjunctiva flap and suture anchoring suture first place in the limbal area. Then one by one you can complete the grafting. Uh, there is a different type of CAC, narrow strip conjunctival autograph. That is the, all the variant, but you know, I think uh, the, the technique I have showed, this is a standard technique. You can do the conjunctival rotational glove, limbal epithelial autograph. And what is a conjunctival limbal, limbal autograph? It is basically addressed to the presumed limbal cell deficiency in pterygium. 
and conjunctival lenticular has been used to include limbal some amount of limbal cell in addition to the conjunctival i am uh, how it is technique is thus during the dissection of your graft you just dissect some amount of uh, uh, limbal cell during that and cut in this line and you that some of the able to transfer the some amount of some amount of uh, limbal cell uh, uh, from here to the defect uh, uh, pterygium area at least you have to go 0.5 mm uh, towards the uh, towards the clear cornea from the limbus i am showing the technique this is uh, uh, this is again i am uh, i am doing uh, the peeling technique it is my preferred technique try to get the separate the try to get the plane once you get the plane it is very difficult uh, easy to peel and without and the corneal surface is very very smooth just try to cleaning with the peeling the with with the area of conjunctival head with that plane i am getting this plane perfectly in this part, in this case and you can see there is a absolutely clean corneal surface now i am dissecting uh, a conjunctival uh, subconjunctival tissue the procedure i followed same as i uh, described the earlier uh, uh, operation there is a lot of fibrosis because this uh, this particular case is basically a recurrent pterygium this is not a primary pterygium and now i am dissecting the all uh, fibrovascular addition and removing removing all subconjunctival tissue and trimming the uh, pterygial head here and now i am assessing the uh, uh, the conjunctival uh, area hello there is some problem in the video it's running now uh, again it's running from the beginning so i am removing as much as subconjunctival tissue fibrosis tissue as much as possible so again i do the diamond work polishing to make it smooth in the cornea and the uh, limbal area and uh, some amount of the scalar area now i i am reduce reducing that making that to anchor which are the both side of the limbus to reduce the conjunctival defect area so that i need a relatively smaller smaller uh, conjunctival graft now marking the area of defect and marking the superior uh, superior part of the conjunctiva making some incision over the cornea so that i can uh, just point, point uh, 0.5 mm so that i can take the some amount of limbal cell again they are using that for set two tooth and there is a one gap in between the two tooth so that i can clearly cut the clear conjunctiva without affecting the tenon the subconjunctival injection of uh, with the bss or xylocan to ballooning of the conjunctiva
try to always try to take a very very thin uh, conjunctival graft without taking disturbing tenon. See, there is a very thin conjunctival bar, removing all that uh, attached sub tenon fiber with the conjunctiva. Now it is very important. Just dissect, dissect just 0.5 millimeter towards the clear cornea to get a some amount of limbal cells. You can see this. I am dissecting the clear cornea so that I am getting some amount of clear cornea cell. Taking the limbal cell with conjunctiva and harvested over the center of the cornea, oriented there, and it should be always keep the limbal cell towards the limbus. And now suture the defect. This is a uh, this is the same technique. Uh, rest of the technique is the same. I am sutured the graft with the base of the conjunct in the uh, with the conjunctiva yeah so i think there is a, some disturbance in the video uh, and uh, this is a, a technically more demanding and time consuming procedure no conclusive evidence so far regarding superiority of limbal conjunctival hello uh, over the conventional conjunctival autograph in the routine case but risk of limbal damage at the donor site is always possible. But uh, uh, some study shows limbal, uh, conjunctive limbal autograph techniques is better than the free flap. But most of the case for the primary pterygium case, CAG is, CAG is enough. CAG as well as the case result of CAG is almost as clear. The conjunctival rotation autograph Yes, uh, uh, this is a, another technique, default technique, just I am, as uh, I take a lot of time in my showing my video, what happened in a crack, crack is a basically reversing the graft. You just remove the, remove the conjunctiva and take the conjunctiva from this conjunctiva, you take it some amount of conjunctiva over the pterygium and reverse that and suture that. In this technique is where there is a lot of uh, scarring of the other conjunctiva, other part of you know, cannot take the good graft. Then this is a very useful technique. Yes, I am just, if possible, I am showing the video, but there is a lot of disturbance in this video. I am not. Showing this, uh, this is a, a patient of double pterygium. I'm removing the pterygium from here. As usual, technique. I'm now I'm scraping the removing the uh, removing the conjunctival corneal scar. I get the plane and removing with the peeling method. I removing the uh, corneal part of the pterygium and getting a smooth corneal surface. 
and doing the diamond work polish to make it more smoother and you can see this is a double pterygium so it is not possible to do and patient is suffering from lot of limbal deficiency so i am taking the graph i'm just fast forwarding the video and this this uh this is conjunctival graft is given to the one place and but this place is given uh not addressed now i am marking over the conjunctiva taking the graft from here and just reverse it limbal side and reverse the graph and suture the graph in that case this is this technique is followed when if this is technically very demanding it is difficult some instance to clean separate epithelium from underlying pterygium vascular tissue graft oversizing is not possible in that particular case graft is always very short size so chances of gapping in between gap uh, graft and host junction there is a lot of gap gap so in into make up the gap we have to give a suture which sometimes very tight so you have to put lot of suture to adjust this gap so reverse gap so uh i am just discussing on uh, sometimes a patient uh, pterygium is come with a with as dr ten is published in uh, 1990 that uh, basically the uh, pterygium is a lo localized limbal cell deficiency so sometimes patient with the uh, patient come with the recurrent pterygium if you not address the this fact then it is it, is, it will going to recur again so uh, this is uh, dr shangwan is described slate technique uh, for the, uh, limbal cell deficiency mini slate technique is a basically offshoot of the slate technique involved placement of limbal transplant over am close the limbus to excision in the pterygium which described by the uh, moy sangam is uh, 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 outlook 5 years back this is a case of a recurrent pterygium five times recurrence almost five times recurrence so we decided to take the uh, mini slate technique in this particular case uh this is a uh, first in this particular case there is a lot of fibrosis i just remove uh, cut the body of the pterygium from the head of the pterygium first then you in this particular in this type of particular way you have to dissect the corneal vascular tissue extensively so sometimes it's very difficult and takes very time consuming you have to keep patience in this particular in this type of cases remove the all kind of uh, vascular tissue fibrovascular tissue from there and remove the pterygium because uh, and extensively dissect the uh, conjunctiva you need to dissect the conjunctiva in this uh, this type of uh, 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 recurrent pterygium with a lot of fibrosis i am applying the mitomycin c uh, it will just one minute there and uh, again smoothing the corneal surface with the diamond bar polish and the part of the limbus then i place the limb uh, amp amniotic membrane from and placing with amniotic membrane and place some glue to adhere it over the surface of the ocular surface 
basically this kind of case is basically the reconstruction of your ocular surface now suture in the uh, uh, aim amniotic membrane with the conjunctiva yeah i'm just little bit fast forward in the uh, showing the technique now i am securing the corneal part with the suturing in the cornea now i am taking the from uh, this is uh, i am taking to the limbal cell from the other eye this is the other eye dissect in the limbus 0.5 mm remove it just 3 mm from a uh, 3 mm tissue from the limbus applying glue to to repair the defect in the other eye and now i this uh, limbal cell i am making four to five uh, eight to nine pieces and keep it over the over the uh, amniotic membrane and placing some glue and applying the bandage contact lens this is a technique of a, a mini slate basically sometimes people can choose the conjunctival graft with amt and sometimes it show that is a give the better result when there is a lot of dissection of the conjunctiva and conjunctival graft, of, graft is not big enough to cover the whole defect this is a uh, post op picture you can see the post op picture uh, uh, this is a uh, this is a one month post op and after one year it is a corneal surface is absolutely fine so with that i just want to conclude my uh, presentation because it, because in very uh, sometimes the recurrent pterygium management of recurrent pterygium is very difficult is you have to reconstruct you have to reconstruct the whole uh, ocular surface to that this because some amount hello hello some amount of uh, there is a, some amount of sometimes a very big amount of limbal cell deficiency and if you if you not address the limbal cell deficiency that cases if you not uh, able to reconstruct the ocular surface properly that is going to recur again thank you thank you for kind presentation and sorry for that my video is not uh, working well uh, over 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 to shagar please yeah uh, thank you very much uh, dr arup uh, as usual it was an excellent presentation from both uh, dr mitra and dr you, uh, uh, yourself uh, very informative you have covered most of the things uh, absolutely from the clinical features to the most advanced management possible uh, there are very few uh, queries which have come one is what suture are you using uh, when you are doing this uh, suturing technique suture hello hello i think we have lost both of them hello yeah i am there i am there hello hello i think we lost arup and bom uh, arup and uh, santana oh okay so i think we'll move on to the next topic then i think we we'll are a little late yes, yeah yes. so so we'll uh, so let me introduce uh, it's my privilege and uh, honor to uh, to invite dr uh, js tetial sir for his lecture uh, he, of course he doesn't need any introduction but for the youngsters who have just joined in ophthalmology i would just like to read out his uh, brief cv he is, uh, sir is professor and head cornea cataract and refractive surgery at rp center aims delhi he is uh, also chairman national eye bank rp center at delhi he is also president of indian society of cornea refractive Surger surgeons he was a past president of delhi ophthalmology society he has huge number of academic and research achievements he has more than 300 publications 
He has authored four textbooks and 52 book chapters. He has uh, done close to more than 30 funded international and national research projects. He has invited he has been invited as a faculty in more than 200 international and national conferences, and he has done live surgical demonstrations in more than 100 surgery, 100 uh, uh, conferences. He's the first Indian to perform live surgery at ACRS uh, uh, in USA, and he has been regularly been conducting instruction courses at many international conferences for years together now. Uh, his, uh, he has been recognized by Government of India by, uh, uh, by giving him a Padma Shri in 2014. He has over 26 orations. He has been recognized as, uh, he has got a Distinguished Teachers Award from Delhi of Tamil Society. Uh, so, and he has been, uh, he has also has uh, achievement awards from American Ophthalmic uh, uh, so Association, American Academy of Ophthalmology. So with this uh, brief introduction, I invite Dr. Tithiyal sir for his talk on metabolic keratopathies. I also want those graduates uh, who are in attendance to know that uh, every president and prime minister and the minister in the government of India that you know has been operated upon for cataract or other thing uh, by Professor Jeevan Tetyal, sir. Uh, he is such a humble person, uh, so nice and so kind of him to have blessed us with his timing. But uh, he, has, he operates and he is operating on all the most BBIPs uh, of, of the country. Um, <laughs> we are so pleased to have you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for a very, very kind words from me. Um, indeed, it's my pleasure to be uh, amongst the uh, PG students. Uh, it gives a real pleasure to interact with the younger generation. Today, I have a talk on uh, uh, rare uh, disorder, which we see in our Hello? practice. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's on a uh, metabolic uh, keratopathy. Uh, no financial disclosure from my side. I would acknowledge my uh, colleague, Dr. Manpreet Kaur, who is an assistant professor with me, helping for this particular uh, slide uh, preparation. Basically, if you look into a corneal anatomy, the corneal stoma is composed of three important things. The one is extracellular matrix, characterocytes, and the nerve fiber uh, plexus. So you look at the cellular matrix is basically made of a type 1 collagen or it will be made of a glycose aminoglycans. In collagen wise, you have three uh, collagen uh, types, uh, keratin sulfate, which is uh, maximum around 65%. Then you have a chondroitin sulfate and dermatin sulfate. So these three things compose type 1 uh, collagen in corneal stoma. So this I'm highlighting because most of the metabolic uh, disorders can be intrinsic to the cornea. Or secondly, because of involvement due to a systemic disease, there's an abnormal accumulation of these storage products in the cornea, basically in the stoma, which interferes with the clarity of cornea. Subsequently, is going to cause uh, visual impairment or a decrease the function of cornea in these cases. There are differential diagnosis wise, these metabolic keratopathies has to be differentiated mainly from a corneal dystrophies because they almost look like similar sometimes. They are bilateral in presentation and sometimes they also have a systemic association also dystrophies. But classically, if you look into a metabolic uh, disorders or metabolic keratopathies, they first affect the peripheral part of the cornea as well as central part of the cornea. It involves more than one layer of a corneal anatomy. So that's a difference from corneal dystrophies. Classically or in general, it is known that corneal dystrophies will limit to a, a one particular layer of the cornea. They normally present in the central part of the cornea to begin with, though they can also involve periphery and deeper subsequently. If you see these two pictures, you can very well see this is a, a dystrophy. This is a macular corneal dystrophy where periphery is clear. And central part of cornea is involved with these deposition and the cloudiness of cornea. This is a case of a mucopolysaccharidosis. You can see a diffuse corneal haze extending from the periphery to center. So these are classical presentation of cornea in metabolic keratopathies. So looking to classification, how do we uh, classify these metabolic keratopathies which involves the cornea? There are four basic groups. One, first one is a disorder of carbohydrate metabolism. Then you have a lysosomal storage disorders. 
or a disorders or lipid lipoprotein metabolism uh, which causes uh, deformity in the cornea or disorders of amino acid nucleic acid and protein metabolism in carbohydrate metabolism disorder you have a diabetic keratopathy in lysosomal mainly mucopolysaccharidosis in lipid you have a hyper or a hypo uh, proteinemia lipoproteinemia or you have a classical snyder's corneal dystrophy in this group in amino acid one the classically we would see cystinosis amyloidosis gout alkaptonuria tyrosinemia these are classical uh, uh, division of metabolic keratopathy you can see so let me take you through the first one which is most commonly seen by us that is a diabetic uh, keratopathy if you look into a pathogenesis there are three basic things in that first is neural dysregulation second is enzymatic dysregulation and structural and functional abnormality which happens because of these uh, neural and enzymatic uh, dysregulation the neural dysregulation basically there is a decreased corneal sensation and decreased corneal nerve fiber plexus density and number in a stoma anterior stoma loss of nerve derived growth factor that is uh, igf1 substrate p in these cases if you see this confocal picture of one of my patient you can see this is a normal arrangement of a, a nerve plexus anterior stoma of normal person this is a diabetic patient where you have a total loss of a, a nerve fiber in fact a thickening of nerve fiber in these cases and that causes decrease in the sensation of these patients in terms of enzymatic dysregulation you all know there is increased polyol metabolism and there is accumulation of polyol in a corneal epithelium and endothelial cells and non enzymatic glycation of protein products will cause advanced glycation end products to be deposited into the corneal layers structural wise basically corneal epithelial areas are uh, involved basal cell as well as you have a, a heavy desposome density decrease in these cases So anatomically, if you look into diabetic keratopathy, the spectrum of clinical feature which you would see would be basically a, a superficial punctate epithelopathy, which is so common for diabetic patients. Corneal hypothesia, persistent epithelial erosions, which will cause non-healing persistent epithelial defects, and corneal edema. We all know patients of diabetic patients undergoing various surgeries like keratoplasty. even a refractive surgery cataract surgery vitreoretina surgery there is a high chances of persistent epithelial defect and uh, causing a subsequent uh, complication in these cases so you have to be very careful operating diabetic uh, cases where you have a blue uh, epithelium so this uh, type of features can be seen almost 50% of diabetic patient would have some sort of a keratopathy in these cases are they just long Uh, management uh, in these cases is basically systemic control of a diabetes that will definitely not change the corneal profile but decrease the incidence of uh, these problems and symptomatic management for these patients you all know you can give lubricants patching contact lenses to decrease the symptoms pain and enhance the epithelial healing sometimes you can use uh, topical uh, igf1 substance which can increase the corneal nerve regeneration and decrease these problem these patients so this is how a diabetic patient you would see as a diabetic uh, uh, metabolic uh, keratopathy second group of cases as i told you in the initial classification is lysosomal storage disorder so basically there is a defect in a lysosomal enzyme or cofactors or a transport protein lysosomal storage disorder will cause so there there can be three types most commonly mucopolysaccharidosis There is accumulation of glycose amine glycans in these cases, or you have a lipidosis or a mucolipidosis. So these cases will have basically a deposition of uh, GAGs, that is glycose amine glycans, heterogeneous group, basically lysosomal storage disorder. There is an intracellular as well as extracellular accumulation of these products. They are normally uh, autosomal recessive, except for a one which is X-linked. incident you can see one in 25000 they are quite rare to see uh, even in a tertiary care center i have been working for last 35 40 years i have not seen more than 10 cases in my practice in terms of surgery for these patients so mainly these are seen by a uh, 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 people who you uh, know tackle the uh, uh, hormone problems or a systemic problem like a, a medicine people there is a wide range of phenot uh, phenotype variety, variety in these cases the treatment is very difficult to uh, cure these cases people try 
uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation in some cases, or the enzyme replacement therapy have been tried in these cases. So if you look into a, a spectrum, this is a, a beautifully made uh, a chart from the so many uh, types of mucopolysaccharidosis. Basically, you have a type 1, which is uh, C or Hurler C or Hurler, or you have a type 2, which is Hunter. Type 3 is San Filippo, A, B, C, D, and 4 is uh, Borchio syndrome, 6 is uh, Bortex, and 7 is Sly, and 9 is uh, Netovix. So all these variety are there. They have a different uh, enzyme deficiency, which you can see in the books. And basically, they all have a deposition accumulation of either of uh, dermatin or heparin uh, sulfate or keratin sulfate in these cases. As I said in the beginning, type 2 is the one which is X-linked uh, in terms of inheritance in these cases. The systemic features are very classical. If you, as soon as you see patient coming to your clinic, you can you know that these patients will have uh, some sort of uh, mucopolysaccharidosis or some sort of a systemic disorder causing uh, visual impairments. So you can see they have a typical prominent uh, clinical features, flattened face, depressed nasal breast, thick lips, enlarged mouth, hearing impairment, skeletal disease, and cardiorespiratory problem in these cases. This is a type one you can see, which basically uh, progressive mental uh, decline is happening in these cases, decreased uh, physical skill, they live almost 10 years, the type 1 variety. Mm -hmm. Type 2, which is uh, a much more common, Hunter syndrome, which has many ocular uh, features like uh, optic nerve swelling or a glaucoma associated skeletal or CNS problems, ectophthalmus, large head in these cases. This is type 3 San Filippo, which has a lot of retinal changes, stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, and they uh, uh, reach up to teen age. Uh, uh, around 18, 19, uh, 20 years, they have a maximum amount of changes in terms of visual deformity wise. Type 4 also more, most commonly seen. They have a lot of skeletal uh, deformity. You can see the spine deformity and other deformity in the uh, hand and uh, legs. They also have a skull uh, deformity also. Luckily, they have a lighter corneal involvement in these cases. So this chart uh, we have made to summarize the entire thing. You can take a snapshot, tells you that if you look at corneal clouding, almost every type of mucopolysaccharidosis will have corneal clouding. They'll range from one plus to three plus, and uh, hurlers is the one where you have more significant corneal clouding. Similarly, retinopathy is always there in uh, most cases, most seen in a San Filippo type three type of NPS. And then you have a glaucoma and optic nerve deformities are also seen in these cases. Apart from other uh, areas, uh, I just uh, showed in one of the slides, pseudo exothalmus is very common in the type 4 Marcos uh, type of uh, MPS in these cases. The corner clouding, maximum with MPS 1, MPS 6, early stages, they remain periphery, and later stage, they come to center, which will uh, get the patient to the or outpatient department or clinic where they require a refraction and the modes of treatment. The management for such cases, because as I said, medical treatment is almost impossible for these cases. The surgical treatment is required. And classically, people are talked about the full thickness keratoplasty in these cases. But we know that in MPS, the decimates and endothelium are spared. So you can do a, a deep until amyloid keratoplasty in such cases. This is one result from uh, uh, Botham et al., where they described penetrating keratoplasty is beneficial in MPS group of patients. This is one of our case. Uh, this uh, child is still uh, coming to me for last uh, 18 years without having recurrence. We did a bilateral deep until amyloid keratoplasty and having a good uh, visual acuity in this uh, case. Similarly, uh, you have uh, patients having a uh, Sorry, there was some uh, interval. Then this is a report of a DALC uh, results happening in very nicely. I'll uh, just show a technique of DALC for uh, understanding of PG students. This is a case where we do a guarded definition up to 70% depth first. So this gives an access for uh, uh, getting into the uh, stoma. I do a little paracentesis from a limbus area. I inject a few bubbles into the antechamber. These bubbles are uh, going to help you to understand the big bubble formation. These are central bubble. As soon as central uh, big bubble forms, 
from the pre-decimatic area. The uh, is going to go down toward the antechamber. These uh, inside bubbles are going to shift to periphery. That will be indication for big bubble formation. You can see I am taking a 20 gauge, uh, gauge needle, bevel down, injecting with uh, two cc syringe. You can see these bubbles have come to periphery. So that increase there's a big bubble formation in the center. Keep injecting till you reach the uh, trifination mark. You can see it is now recent trifination mark. That's the completion of big bubble. The initial paracentrase also helps in a big bubble formation. Now, after big bubble formation, we'll do a superficial uh, dissection of uh, a stroma so that you can read the thin stromal layer to puncture the big bubble in these cases. This is more important for a thick cornea, which you see in a, a mucopolysaccharidosis or a, a other forms of metabolic keratopathy. We do an open dissection so that if there's a bubble damage, you can see them very carefully. Now, what we are going to do uh, subsequently after we dissect out, this is a central area. And still the bubble is intact because these bubble, uh, the AC bubbles are periphery. You have to be very careful when you are doing uh, these dissections. After we do a dissection, we do a nick into the uh, thin stroma here. This will leak the you know, big bubble and the peripheral bubbles shift to center, the AC bubbles. So that indicates the bubble has gone released. This space now has to be uh, replaced by the viscoelastic. We inject uh, sodium hyaluronate in this, which is clean and clear and replaces the space now. And we can now cut this superficial stroma with a thin uh, uh, bana seizure, which is smooth and has a smoother uh, tip so that it doesn't damage the decimates. So we do a four quadrantic uh, stromal damage uh, dissection in this particular case. And subsequently, we can uh, take care of uh, dissection in this case and replace the entire disease stroma with a healthy uh, donor tissue subsequently and suture it. Unfortunately, I can't uh, really shift this. Uh, yeah, I'll just skip the video now, that basic understanding. So I would say uh, DAL gives a nice opportunity to maintain the patient's own endothelium. The third category is uh, lipidosis where basically you have uh, a complex lipid uh, disorder, inherited disorder. There are three types, Febreze, multiple sulfatase deficiency, and generalized uh, ganglocytosis in these cases. Febreze are commonly seen, more commonly seen. It is a lysosomal storage disorder. Alpha galactoside A is a deficient enzyme in these cases. The accumulation of uh, global trial ceramide in these cases they're much rarer than MPS, 1 in 60,000, excellent re recessive. They are basically, you can see a, a corneal uh, 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 pattern, which is like a uh, you know, uh, central corneal opacification, like a snake line uh, type of deformity. You can see classically central part of cornea is involved. Around 70% of favorite disease patients will have a, some sort of a corneal involvement. And sometimes you can have posterior subcastular cataract also seen in these cases. You have a tortuous vessel. Uh, which is seen in uh, uh, flourishing angiography in these cases, Fabry disease. Other ophthalmic manifestation in Fabry's would be a uh, conjunctival intracellular uh, inclusions. Also, you have a rare retinal RT occlusion, optic disc edema can be seen. Some patients come with optic atrophy also. Rarely, you have a lid involvement in these cases and dry eye. In, uh, classically, they live longer, up to a fifth decade of life. Therefore, they require a good uh, visual uh, rehabilitation in these cases. Uh, mucolipidosis, uh, there are a uh, few types from a uh, one to a uh, four types. The basic uh, ophthalmic manifestation, which you can see in these patients, is mild granular stromal opacities. They don't really interfere with uh, uh, vision in these cases. And uh, in this lipoproteinemia, again, there are three varieties hyperlipoproteinemia or hypolipoproteinemia. But we see more of a scenarios, crystalline corneal dystrophy quite often in our clinic. And uh, basically, they have a, a arcus formation in the periphery in a very young age. They can have gentle asthmas and lip, uh, lipemia and retin retinitis in these cases. So if you look at these are corneal findings, bilateral uh, uh, cholesterol uh, deposition and entry stroma in these cases, central corneal haze, mid peripheral haze, and arcus in these cases. So this is what you see a uh, diffuse central uh, uh, deposition of a cholesterol crystals and peripheral arcus, which is classically seen in uh, a cyanide crystalline corneal dystrophy.
management again these patients basically uh, there no treatment as such people have done a ptk to remove the anterior coronary irregularities sometimes they do require a, a, a partial thickness lamellar keratoplasty or full thickness keratoplasty they do well uh, because these pa patients live almost normal life as such hypolipoproteinemia have a similar uh, presentations coronal opacities or a diffuse coronal haze normally they don't cause visual uh, symptoms because they do have peripheral involvement much more than central and they can have uh, venous dilatation and geostic sometimes these cases as i said cystinosis i have seen quite a number of cases they are autosomal recessive they have uh, basically lysosomal lacerol disease their dysfunction of uh, lysosomal membrane which causes uh, protein uh, cystinosis in these cases this is what you see in the cornea diffuse uh, crystal type of appearance right from center to periphery and they cause uh, uh, decreased vision in these patients and they present quite early in a life so that, that's why these patients come to you early and sometimes they can also uh, highlight the systemic involvement for these patients they can on a long run they can have a pigmented retinopathy and they can have uh, deposition of uh, these crystals in the retina conjunctiva iris wherever you have a vessel they get deposited also the management is uh, uh, again uh, keratoplasty if they are very diffuse they live up to second decade therefore uh, whatever uh, life they have uh, they have to be given a good vision but mainly they have a, a renal involvement which is much more in these cases so they require a renal dialysis sometimes they require a kidney transplantation if that is successful they live slightly longer than a second decade of life the oral uh, cysteamine have been tried in these cases early intervention sometimes disease reversal is seen in uh, these cases as such management as i said you can try oral uh, cysteamine and uh, the dose is quite high in such cases and very difficult to uh, maintain the drug uh, you have to keep a cold chain for uh, maintaining this drug in these cases amyloidosis i think you will know and you have seen many cases classically this is the largest group of uh, deposition we see in a cornea they basically diagnosed uh, clinically also because of excess of hyaline of hyaline which is uh, stained by copper you all know that and apple green uh, bifringes can be seen in a microscopy in polarized microscopy these are a four variety you can see primary and secondary localized or systemic disorder in these cases systemically they have a peripheral neuropathy Uh, which causes uh, which is non diabetic cardiomyopathy which is a major problem for all these amyloidosis patient nephrotic disease causing kidney problems and hepatomegaly so uh, both renal and hepatic and cardiac problems are there in these patients this is a, a gamut of ocular features which we see routinely they can involve uh, adenexa and as a mass or tissue infiltration they can cause ptosis diplopia irritation epiphora compression of optic nerve also requiring a optic nerve decompression sometimes conjunctival uh, granuloma can be seen and in retina also they can uh, have a vitreous retinal amyloidosis basically you see a glass wool appearance of an entire uh, vitreous cavity in retina in these cases uh, which is classically seen but classically we see a lot of corneal changes so this is one combination of uh, granular deposits and you have a lattice plan so this is called abelianoid type of dystrophy or you have a clear lattice uh, line you can see under retroillumination also a filamentary branching pattern in these cases seen this is another uh, picture of uh, amyloidosis in a cornea lattice dystrophy hyaline deposits and these are gametes of uh, types of amyloidosis involving the cornea localized cornea involvement or you have a, a no uh, system involvement so range only cornea or a cornea and system involvement all three are there in these patients gout uh, basically urate uh, crystals are deposited in the cornea in these cases this is a classical picture of gout uh, uh, you can see in these patient coming as a band shaped keratopathy which is classically seen and the management you all know is edta chelation or sometimes you can do a ptk type of uh, thing in these cases in early cases and vision improves subsequently this is i think pg should know how to uh, do a chelation to use a 20% alcohol to depithelize the uh, corneal epithelium because sometimes it's very difficult to scrape out without uh, using the alcohol and then use edta in the form of uh, disodium uh, edta 0.37% in eye drops in a well and apply them for 3 uh, minutes 
and they will cause uh, loosening of a cal calcium deposits which can be derived from the corneal stoma on apart from keeping the well uh, with the edta simultaneously you can do a debridation also that causes easy uh, chelation of a calcium from the corneal stoma subsequently you can give a bandage contact lens that will help you in a decreasing pain and a rapid epithelialization of these patients so basically uh, metabolic keratopathies are systemic metabolic disorders generating in origin most cases there is an alteration in a corneal clarity and its function and usually they are autosomal recessive rarely they can be as x linked recessive also management as we discussed through uh, various types of uh, mucopolysaccharidosis and other uh, causes of lipidosis is basically to look into underlying systemic disorder some cases you can do a enzymatic replacement therapy or sometime you can look for uh, giving a keratoplasty as a alternative to clear the uh, uh, area of uh, opacity in these cases that i was discussing deep anti lamellar keratoplasty where you can take with the entire disease stoma and leave the clear decimates and endothelium behind and subsequently replace the donor uh, cornea the advantage of a dark in such cases is is retain the patient's endothelium and they can survive for a more than 50 years unlike full thickness graft the endothelium may not last for a more than 5 to 10 years this is a confocal microscope of one of the dark patient you can see this is the endothelium normal this is a decimate interface this is a posterior stoma this is a mid stoma you can see a lot of keratocytes this is the anterior stoma and this is a basal layer of epithelium the normal uh, confocal microscopy can be seen in these cases so we have done dark for our various types of indications uh, in these cases you can see this is our harlech c patient what about uh, reversing the keratopathy as is talked about in some cases especially with amino amino acid uh, problems this is one case reported in literature uh, by steward et al hypertyrosinemia and they did a intermittent low dose uh, nitrosonin in a alkaptonuria al patient and this was a picture in the cornea to begin with and this disappeared subsequently with the treatment so there is a possibility for a reversal also but uh, we know like a dystrophy in uh, these metabolic keratopathy also there can be recurrence of disease also this is one of the patient had a metabolic keratopathy diffuse corneal involvement right from the anterior stoma to posterior stoma underwent keratoplasty and after 3 years there is a recurrence of a disease in terms of you can see the confocal microscopy this is a, a deposition which has happened into the anterior mid uh, stoma of uh, uh, this case after keratoplasty the recurrence can also occur therefore uh, if you do a lamellar keratoplasty replacement surgery can be easier rather than a full thickness surgery in these cases so recurrence can be similar in both uh, dark as well as penetrating keratoplasty also so i would understand for a post grad students uh, these are rare cases but uh, they, they do get uh, such question in the as a theory exams sometimes they do get uh, cases in a spotter or short cases so there you have to know what would be the uh, actual type of corneal clouding happening in these patients which uh, this, uh, metabolic keratopathy will cause more corneal uh, deposition and visual impairment should be known and ocular features are sometimes classical in these cases but uh, classically they come from periphery and center and they can involve uh, all the layers of cornea also systemic disease is a major presenting feature for most cases but there are some cases which come to us first and because of that we can uh, find out the cardiac pathology which can be life threatening in these cases so you have to be very careful seeing these patient and refer these patient for a systemic analysis so we can improve their quality of life with by taking care of systemic disease also for a opacities or a, a deposition which cause uh, corneal central corneal clouding you require a keratoplasty to be done and dark is one of the best uh, approach for these patient to have a improvement vision subsequently also i would understand most cases they present quite early in age sometime within a first uh, decade of life they would require a very good optical correction if you do surgery or don't do surgery also if you do surgery then uh, you have to do a good correction they have astigmatism sometimes and you have to prevent amblyopia or they have amblyopia that should be treated subsequently also just doing keratoplasty doesn't su suffice we have to do uh, other associated management also
I would say thank you for kind attention for this uh, theoretical talk. But it has a lot of importance for a postgraduate students, how to classify them, how to understand the uh, corneal, retinal, and the systemic uh, features in these cases. Thank you uh, for kind listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. It was a, a great uh, talk from you. And uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, your presentation would be sufficient enough for all the postgraduate to do whatever preparation they have to do on this topic. I think uh, it was a fantastic uh, resource that you have presented today. Thank you indeed for your time and your uh, uh, efforts, sir. So there is a question that has come up for you, sir. Uh, the yeah, question yeah. is, what is the prognosis of keratoclast in embolic keratopathies? So as I, as I told in between also, the prognosis of keratoplasty is very good because uh, these cases don't have uh, vascularization and the graft can be done very nicely, a uh, good size graft, central graft, and because they don't have vascularization, therefore the chances of rejection is very less. Graft survival is quite long in these cases. And if you do a, a lamellar procedure like a DALP, that also has a very nice prognosis. So they are like a coronary dystrophy or a, like a keratoconus patient as far as graft uh, success is concerned in these cases. Okay. As for metabolic keratopathies, there are no further questions. But there are some questions on pterygium. I, I don't know. Dr. Arub Bhamik is there? Dr. Arub Bhamik, Dr. Shantana Mitra? I think they are there. So, yeah. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Had, so there was, we yeah, had a yeah. So there basic, are some questions. Yeah. Yeah. We had yeah. a basic problem in generator system, internet system. Even mobile oh, tower okay. is gone for a moment. I don't know what oh, happens in that area. Uh, so we uh, came out from yeah. that area and uh, able to answer this yeah. all the question. And I am again right. sorry for the right. my technical glitch for the, my presentation because I think uh, my video is a uh, slightly heavy that that cannot put uh, transfer oil. Hello, hello. Uh, but uh, most of the things were understood well. Not mm. a problem at all. We, and the question that was asked about your technique is what suture do you use for your drafting? It is a vehicle suture. It is a, uh, you can choose a six zero vehicle if. if if you able to handle, you can use the 90 of Ecreel also. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, there, uh, and, and uh, uh, a for, for for suturing technique, I think the single lump is suffice. If you if you uh, your graft size is well, if your graft size is good enough, it is not very short graft. It is a at least one millimeter over the size of the conjunctival defect. Your graft size is more than that. Then uh, only one single knot is suffice, and you can see that after five days, it will automatically loosen up, and you can very uh, very easy to take it off. So uh, for suture, it is a, you can give a only single suture, only single knot, not the double locking, not the locking, any locking, just single lock. Okay. And same suture, you would use it for the bare bare sclera that gets created after the after the at the donor site. At the donor site, the no, same donor, suture is used. Donor site, I just want to take the opinion of TTL sir also. Donor site, if if I able to make a very thin graft without the damaging the tenon, it is basically no necessary to suture the donor site. That's correct. You yeah. don't have to do anything there because the uh, conjunctival will grow very fast. Yeah, yeah. I don't do any suture in the donor site until yeah. unless I, I feel there is a lot of uh, tenon damage, then I, I sometimes suture that. But most of the time, 95% cases, I leave the my donor site as it is and conjunctival place is regrowth within seven days, seven to eight days completely. Then I think that's correct, uh, Arup. Uh, Maybe. The important consideration sometimes, you know, some patients can have a, a recurrent pterygiums. Then you have to uh, uh, look for other areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we have seen, you know, uh, you can uh, redo that area also. You can take the conjunctiva from same site after uh, one or two years also. Yeah, if you're exactly. not damaged the limbus area. Yeah. If you're not doing an LCAT type of uh, uh, yeah. issue or yeah. you showed that, you know, simple, uh, so, simple uh, so, select so. type of issue. 
Yeah, that's why the CAG CAG is a conjunctival yeah. autograph taking so popular because you not damage the limbal area. Even after two years, if you need, you can take the conjunctiva from the same place. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, any that's thoughts about uh, anti metabolite anti metabolite use MMC in recurrent teresia? Uh, is it definitely being used? Uh, yeah, uh, anti metabolite MMC is very good. But a, com a, a combination MMC MMC with uh, with uh, uh, AMT uh, amniotic main transplantation is give more much better result than only AMC alone. I feel I I just want to know the sir's opinion, Dr. TTL's opinion regarding this. And I prefer to do amniotic main grafting whenever it is necessary, especially. Uh so you are correct, Arup. Absolutely correct. Uh, normally, it should not be a primary uh, a treatment for a primary TGM surgery. You should avoid anti metabolites there, especially uh, slightly older patients, very young patient you might consider. But for recurrent TGM, what he nicely described also, you can use uh, uh, mitomycin C and use either a conjunctiva over that or a AMT in these cases. Don't leave bear uh, in uh, these cases because that is going to cause uh, necrosis. And uh, sometimes I feel that the conjunctival uh, graft is very small, not able to cover the whole defect area. Whenever I, I have to dissect a lot of fibrotic tissue and there is a lot of conjunctival defect, then I always prefer to put a one AMT over the conjunctival graft. And, and that that time it is giving a very good result. Very, so good, point. Mm -hmm, yeah. very good point. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, uh, they, they can be, you know, uh, tissue disparity can be there. But if you can cover almost, you know, uh, the, uh, the main area of exposed area, the, there's a congenital growth coming from other sites also. And I normally such cases would combine, uh, you know, glue and suture. Yeah. So that retain the graft, uh, that can stretch the graft nicely. Mm. So combination of glue and suture can be done apart from suture or glue. Mm. Okay. So, and, and uh, another common uh, query is uh, once you have done a pterygium surgery, when when would be the right time to take up that patient for cataract surgery? The patient is waiting for cataract surgery, undergoes uh -huh. surgery. <laughs> it's a, it, how much time it takes? It is really, really <laughs> difficult to uh, uh, comment as a single, every case should be individual. Uh, individualize the case because uh, uh, most of the cases, primary pterygium, Primary TGM without any distortion of the corneal lot of, you can take up both of surgery even after six weeks. That's but good. if uh, uh, even after six weeks, but it's a recurrent TGM, lot of lot of corneal distortion is there. It is better to wait, and uh, there is there is serial. Uh, if possible, it will do the serial topography. How it will change? If you think that uh, the cornea is a little bit stable and your surface is very stable. You can take up uh, or take up the case uh, for cataract surgery. Even in that particular case, you may have to wait another uh, uh, four to six months if there is a lot of uh, corneal scarring and you have to do lot of uh, lot of uh, uh, keratectomy or diamond bar, bar bar polishing. I think it's better to wait because uh, sometimes you mistakenly can implant uh, toric oil. And after after uh, after cornea stabilize, you see there are a lot of uh, re astigmatism reducing. So uh, if you if you want to do uh, the good cataract surgery, implant the prior uh, uh, premium IL, it is better to uh, wait for uh, wait for four to six months if uh, your cornea is not very good. Dr. But, Arup. Mm. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, you, uh, this is Dr. Mitra. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just I just want to suggest one thing here that uh, if there is a topographic changes of more than three diopter, it's better to go for the pterygium surgery first and then wait for at least two to three months and then do uh, cataract surgery, particularly with premium IOS, as you have told. Uh, yeah. what, what do you suggest, Dr. Tedial? The same, uh, I think um, Bobbik has given a nice uh, description how to approach these cases. But you are right, uh, we need to, because these patients, uh, they develop pterygium because of uh, some sort of ocular surface problem they would have. So they require a very stable ocular surface before we jump for a surgery for these cases. 
as you rightly said, if you have a good topography system, you can do a topography serial and see how effective you are. For a student, I'll understand to assess the corneal surface. Regularly under straight lamp, uh, you need to, you know, no corneal examination complete without putting a one drop of prosin in the surface. That gives you a picture of a cornea, limbus, conjunctiva, everything. So whenever you have a corneal examination, must uh, do a flocin staining. That gives a lot of information to a uh, you know, picture which you see. And cataract surgery can, and if uh, cataract is not advanced, you can wait and uh, get a good surgery done at uh, Dr. Bomick's head. Okay. So this is a question for you, uh, Dr. Titel, sir. Mm -hmm. What is the basic dif difference between corneal dystrophy and metabolic keratopathy? Why can't metabolic keratopathy be classified under corneal dystrophy? There are, there are two diff, diff, uh, distinct entity, corneal dystrophy and metabolic keratopathy. This uh, initial slide of mine showed the how to differentiate the two. Dystrophy is normally a few classical definition why they involve a single layer and they start from a, you know, normally centrally located and very, very uh, towards the end of uh, a disease, they involve the periphery or deeper layers or anterior layers. So classically, they are bilateral, symmetrical, and centrally oriented uh, most of the time. And they also have a genetic predisposition. While metabolic keratopathies have more systemic uh, involvement, they are basically because of systemic disease. And they start mainly from periphery and recenter, and they involve more than one layer. Though their presentation sometimes can be similar in terms of visual impairment wise, but uh, it depends what type of uh, metabolic disorder these people have. Uh, classically, the early onsets of uh, mucopolysaccharidosis type and late onsets of uh, amyloidosis or a diabetic patients or other uh, uh, protein or lipidosis patients. So you can differentiate by just seeing them by uh, systemic features most of the time because the dystrophies don't have uh, systemic uh, deformities more often. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, a question uh, regarding BCL use after pterygium surgery. Bandage contact lens. Dr. Shantanu can take this question. Do you use BCL routinely post pterygium surgery? Uh, mostly, uh, we, do, we do not need a BCL after pterygium surgery, but while uh, you are using a blue or bandage uh, contact lens. Uh, bandage contact lens. No, uh, bandage contact lens after the after the pterygium surgery. No, yeah. normally we do not need. We do not need a BCL after pterygium surgery. Uh, I think it is not needed. Basically, blue is needed where we are uh, doing the slate or uh, uh, mini slate. But generally, uh, BCL is not needed. So, the basic idea, I think, was how do you manage the defect post-surgery? Because you need to start the topicals from next day. Uh, uh, so, uh, the defect has to be managed along with it. Do you patch in between topicals or you keep the patient only uh, topicals? So, uh, uh, epithelial defect uh, sugar is a not contraindication for using steroid, I think. Uh, even even uh, PRK, you can see the you do now a lot of uh, 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 refractive surgery. Do it. PRK, we start, uh, start. Uh, 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 um, stronger steroid in a, with a with a higher frequency even after three days you do a, a prk even then if you do the prk with a brush or whatever technique you will do or a alcohol technique you remove the all the alcohol and put the mmc over that then it takes at least complete regeneration of epithelium it takes at least seven eight days even then you start the steroid now so so epithelial defect is a, not a contraindication to applying steroid. It is better to put some uh, broad spectrum antibiotic along in steroid. But I think that if your uh, surface is sterile, if if you are maintain uh, operating a sterile surface, it's not uh, issue to uh, use steroid. Uh, right. Uh, uh. I think uh, we are coming to the end of the session. I don't see any further questions. Uh, any 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 thoughts? Anything you would like to add, sir? Or 
Dr. Aru, Dr. Shantanu. I think we had a very fruitful discussion also uh, with a lot of questions being asked. Uh, uh, Dr. Aru, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, would you manage uh, pterygium excision uh, in any other way uh, in uncontrolled diabetes? Uh, uncontrolled diabetes, there is a, uh, if you uncontrolled diabetes, uh, you, see the pterygium surgery is an, a, not an emergency surgery. So uh, we can uh, uh, always uh, wait for three months to get the uh, diabetic control, diabetes control. So uh, it is not the issue to uh, do uncontrolled diabetes. Even then, if you think the patient is a uh, uh, very difficult stage of met metabolic disease, diabetes with renal failure, can't operate. But in that particular case, uh, I think you can, uh, in addition, you can, uh, if, it is uh, threatening threatening the uh, your uh, 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 visual axis. Then you can use uh, the the fura uracil or avastin interleukin. But I think it is logical. But uh, uh, get the uh, metabolic stage or diabetes control under control, and you can operate that patient. But it is not terigem uh, operation. But terigem patient not at all a emergency patient. Sir, sir, one TTL, sir, one question I want to ask you. I am a yeah, yeah. Se second year postgraduate. I am doing a pterygium surgery for the first or second time. And suddenly near the limbus, I enter the AC, the AC becomes flat. Uh, what what do I do next, sir? <laughs> that that shows that uh, you know, the person doesn't have an understanding of uh, entire anatomy. That person should again do a wet lab training first, see some more videos, and then jump for surgery. I think nowadays surgery can be learned, you know, but there are so many good videos. Uh, even uh, Dr. Bombic has so many videos there in uh, uh, YouTube. But uh, it's a rare chance that you can enter uh, into anterior chamber through limbus. That normally happens in a uh, difficult cases like a, a, a Recurrent, recurrent pterygium where a lot of fibrosis and previous uh, previous dissections have been done. A lot of cautery has been done in the past or a use of uh, antimatriotic drug in such cases would have a very thin uh, you know, sclera. Their chance of perfusion would be there. So it would depend whatever uh, profession you have. Uh, it is because of uh, inadvertent entry of your uh, dissector or blade or a, a crescent knife that, that can be sutured with a tenno suture. If it is because of a melting, then you can have a tissue defect sometimes. There you require a corneal patch to be done in such case. So I would understand if uh, PG has that problem of uh, entering into entry chamber, it will be because of dissection only. Just uh, one or two interpret suture will suffice. And if it is a defect, then you have to do a patch graph. That would, uh, after that, you have to cover the entire area with uh, a congenital graft, if that is not available, as Dr. Bombic talked about, we should do a, a amniotic membrane graft to cover the, that area because such cases will have uh, difficult healing also. So after putting suture, form the chamber, make sure it is uh, watertight, the echo should not leak from that. So that should be done and avoid too much of cauterization at that, that particular area. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, AC penetration, uh, uh, corneal full thickness uh, penetration, not possible in case of primary pterygium. It's not possible. Yeah, yeah that's Plus, true. Yes. A, if it is a pseudo pterygium, it is not basically a pterygium. It is a something else. This is a, due to the uh, uh, gross uh, limbal cell deficiency. There is a vascularization. It's a called a pseudo pterygium. Sometimes we call pseudo pterygium. Then the, under the uh, uh, vascularization, there may be a very, very thin cornea. Or if there is a recurrent history of recurrent surgery, then it's a cornea may be thin. Then that case, these uh, these cases should be taken up by a very senior surgeon, not a very junior surgeon, very expert surgeon. Even specially, I will know it is it should be done by the corneal surgeon. That not, is true. No yeah. other. Sometimes they these patients you said a pseudo pterygium. Patient has a past history of chemical injuries, so you have to have a very careful assessment of these cases. Sometimes you may have to do a a uh, UVM to see what is lying behind this uh, pseudo pterygium, which is thick and fibrotic. And uh, before you take this surgery, you do a good assessment. Either you do a UVM, sometimes antisegment OCT can delineate. But classically, recurrent pterygiums, history of injury, chemical injuries, 
you should do a UVM to analyze the deeper involvement and the structure can be analyzed very carefully with UPM. I think this is something, uh, okay, Satyajit, uh, good evening and uh, wish you all the best for the future programs. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aru, Dr. Shantanu. You are, you need to unmute, Dr. Satyajit. Yeah. I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jeevan Dityal. I'd like to thank Dr. Santanu Mitra. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Arup uh, Bhaumik and Dr. Sagar Bhargav for this uh, excellent uh, talk on pterygium and uh, uh, corneal uh, metabolic dystrophy. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you all the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.